Yes, I do. Contact C. It helps you get on with your day. BCTV. Good morning. I'm going to tackle the latest puzzling development in the Bandiero case. That's a woman, Liv Bandiero, who nine months after the death of a three-year-old boy was arrested, charged, and jailed for some time on the murder charge, and who's, that's a little boy there too, and who has gone through the agonies of the damned only to find that without even a preliminary hearing, the Crown stayed the charges of murder against her. This is the Cortez Island story. That's one thing we're going to do this morning. We're also going to start a new news feature on Webster today called That's a Fair Question. Many times we get fair questions which get lost in the shuffle. So we're going to deal with them one at a time. And I'm going to give you a sample of three of the questions we're going to tackle today. Is it true that BC Hydro is overstaffed by 200%? Can retired policemen and pensions hold full-time jobs in the civil service? And do hookers ever pay their fines or have to to City Hall in Vancouver under that anti-hooking bylaw? And then, for lighter relief this morning, the intrepid Wyatt went out and met the incredible Plimpton, the man of many faces, the world's leading professional amateur. And it'll be interesting to see if he looks as young in our shots as he does in his commercials. Here's Plimpton. I do think it's interesting that um, what you really are more frightened of than anything else is humiliation. It's not being crushed by somebody that weighs 300 pounds or it's not uh, falling into the net. It's, what it is, is is falling into the net when there are a lot of people watching and you're supposed to be completing a, a graceful trapeze act or uh, going back to pass and fumbling the ball. I mean, those are, that's humiliation. That's humiliation. And for light relief this morning, I have my old friend Gardy Gardam who is a Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs in the Social Credit Government. Yes, we still have one in Victoria. But he is going to try and explain to us, after a hundred years, there's a possibility that we may have a fair and decent expropriation law in British Columbia. First, though, for the Bandiero case after the break. Check that she's here at the ground feed. Pardon? They never have him say anything. Okay, he's gonna... On the face of it, Liv, Liv Bandiero and her common law husband were wronged in what happened to them after the death of their child some time ago. The little boy died, in Campbell, died on the way to Campbell River Hospital. He died, and his body was bruised in many places at many times. Bandiero, the woman, had taken that little boy to six doctors, so nobody can say that she neglected the child medically at any time. She was back and forward to doctors like nobody's business. But her incredible anguish was compounded by the fact that it wasn't until nine months after the death of the child that she was, in fact, charged, along with her common-law husband, with first-degree murder. Off she went to jail, six weeks. She was six and a half months pregnant, purely as an aside. And the neighbors in Cortez Island rallied round like you ain't never seen before, raised 125000 in property sureties for their bail, $10,000 in cash. And as she stands now, there she is, still owes $19,000 to lawyers, and as I said earlier, the charge laid, not even a preliminary hearing, and the charge dropped again. Now, this baby was, on the face of it, covered with bruises. But an incredible thing happened after our fairly lengthy broadcast yesterday. Off the air, we were 
we were flooded with phone calls from mothers who said, hey, the symptoms of the Bandieri baby, Bandiero baby, were the same as my child. Inexplicable, mysterious bruises appearing and going away again. And in some cases, the child, one case, the child did not live. In the other cases, the child did live. And what impressed me was this flood of phone calls from these women who said, listen, we had the same thing in our family, and we felt so guilty about it. It looked as if the child had been beaten, but he hadn't been beaten. So I checked with some pediatricians, and pediatricians are kind of cautious talking to people like me when... There will be, I hope, a full-scale inquest into it, but there is a symptom called purpura, where bleeding from the blood vessels goes onto the skin surface, and it has the appearance of a bruise, but without the swelling. This condition can rarely, but sometimes, be fatal in itself. And mothers, when they see this happen, generally panic and think, oh, my God, he's fallen down the stairs. Oh, my God, he's got leukemia. Oh, my God, he's got this and that. But it was a flood of phone calls which made me so anxious, and there are other things that must be considered in this. Well, how was the investigation conducted? Yesterday when I talked to Susan Robertson, the neighbor and friend of Liv Bandiero, she made one very interesting statement to me, which I think are two interesting statements, which are worth thinking about right now. And I had asked uh, uh, Suzanne Robertson how the police had treated them at the time of the investigation. The uh, officer came and talked to my husband and he said, I want you to know that this is a murder investigation and you are all under suspicion. And uh, either one of you or all of you knows what was going on around here and I'm just going to wait and find out because one of you eventually is going to talk. I want you to tell me the story about the bruises that you saw them. The bruises would... Uh appear they would start out very small perhaps the size of a nickel or a dime and if you looked at those same bruises half an hour later they had spread it's like they spread under the skin and and I was in and out of her house all the time and and in fact had David at my house uh, several times so you could virtually see you these bruises see appear and swell. That, no, there was no swelling. They appear and spread. That's right. Now, from the flood of phone calls I got yesterday from worried uh, mothers who had gone through the same kind of experience, I picked one to talk to this morning. Lillian, do you mind telling me your experience with your child? No, um, uh, she was two years old, and it was the same kind of situation with the blood uh, coming out of the blood vessels under the skin. And very frightening. Uh, but she, you know, there didn't seem to be any reason for it. She was a small child, so you thought maybe she would have fallen, but it, it didn't seem to be bruised. You what know? What did the doctors say it was? It was, I think it was pure pura. I can't remember the name now exactly, but uh, it was very frightening to us because they said that it was the platelet count that was so far down, and within a few hours she could have had a brain hemorrhage. And died from and it. Died, but she, yes. But she didn't. No, she didn't. But we, within, you know, we just got her there within a few hours, and we were just new in the city and didn't have a doctor here, so it was just scary to us as parents. In other words, it looked like the child had been badly bruised. Yes. In fact, she was in the hospital for about a week before we knew what it was, and they told us it was to do with her blood, and we thought of leukemia and were very scared. And people, other parents on the ward would see her and think we had beaten her. They wouldn't say maybe, but they'd kind of look at you funny, you know. And the child fully recovered? Yes, she's recovered, yes. Well, thank you for your experience on that, because we got so many calls just to you, people with the same symptoms and children in their family, that it's the kind of thing you've got to bring to public attention. Thank you, Lillian. Okay. Now, according to the chief coroner in British Columbia, Alan Askey is going to investigate to investigate if he should have a public inquest. Well, there's been a police investigation that went on for God knows how long. There's been a Crown Council investigation that's gone on for God knows how long. And I would respectfully suggest that it doesn't need two weeks for Mr. Askey or Bob Galbraith to gather information to, sit, to decide whether or not there is a public inquiry. Sufficient doubts have been raised about the handling of this entire investigation that nothing short of a full public inquest can possibly satisfy the situation. 
And at the same time, I know that anyone can be charged with an offence under the criminal code, and if you're acquitted, you walk away with the burden of all the costs on your back. That's part of the price for living in a society where there are public trials. But in this case, if Mrs. Bandiero is totally and absolutely cleared than this, it, after the public inquiry, it certainly would be the time for the government to make an ex gratia payment to cover the additional $19,000 in legal fees that she now has. She also wants an apology. But it's the kind of story that makes you... I'm not suggesting anything dreadfully bad was done in this case, but it does look as if maybe a medical condition was confused with child beating, which may have led to this unhappy, serious of incidents and the anguish of Liv Bandiero. Next, uh, Gadi Gardam on the new expropriation law after the break. Gadi Gardam is Minister of Intergovernmental Relations, and I asked him here this morning to be quite specific to me about this new Expropriation Act. How many years, Mr. Gardam, and this is a non-partisan remark like Trudeau's broadcast tonight, <laughs> how many years is, is it since J.V. Klein did the original study of the expropriation laws in British Columbia because of a public outcry at the time over a Dees Island expropriation? I happen to have the date, 1964, and he followed that Dees Island expropriation. That was the the Klein report, and then we had the report of the uh, B.C. Law Reform Commission in 1971. It's been researched to death across the country. Mc McRuer did a terrific job in Ontario. Uh, John Turner, when he was Minister of Justice, eventually brought in a bill for Canada. And I'm happy to say, at long last, we've got something down the track for B.C. Is this in the form of a statute yet, which is in front of the House? No, it isn't. What is it? It's then? a green paper. We have solicited public opinion, and I would really emphasize as much as I possibly can, if anybody's interested in this topic, would they please write to room 167 to be precise in the Parliament Buildings Victoria and receive a copy of this document, Discussion Paper for Expropriation. Now, property rights, of course, are not in the Constitution, nor could they go into the Constitution because of the opposition of the NDP. Is that right? Well, that happened, yeah, in January of 1981. And you have to remember that this is when Mr. Trudeau was on his unilateral uh, tack. This was also before there was mounting public uh, opposition to his unilateral activity. It was before the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada that ruled his proposals, uh, though legal, unconstitutional. And at that point in time, uh, uh, the Conservative Party, if memory serves, proposed an amendment in front of the Senate House of Commons Committee to include property, uh, rights. property rights. And that came in on a Friday, and it was agreed to by Mr. Kaplan, the Solicitor General, on the Friday. He agreed to anything. And to, there was a 180-degree turn over the weekend, and Mr. Kretien came in and said no. And I think your assumption and mine and the assumption of the Canadian public is that Mr. Broadbent was going to pull out his support. Well, they were in a tricky position. I mean, provinces surely must control property rights because land belongs to the provinces, doesn't it? The, 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 yes, that's true. But this is not a delimination of, of property rights vis-a-vis -a, -vis a citizen. This is providing every citizen across Canada with a property right. Now, under the... Uh, under the and that's not in the Constitution? No way. At the present time, everyone's... This is, is Section 7 of the Charter, and I would like to read it. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And what we proposed in our legislature, I introduced a resolution this year, it was passed unanimously in September 21, to include enjoyment of property. I have sent that resolution to my counterparts in Canada, also to the uh, Governor General, and quite frankly, if we have seven of the ten provinces representing 50% of the population and the Senate and the House of Commons approve it, it will become the law of the land. And I'm encouraged at this point in time by the response that I've received across the country. All right, but nevertheless, even if you get that in the Constitution, you now have it in a motherhood resolution in the B.C. legislature. Well, it, no, it's not, it's, with all respect, uh, it, it's motherhood, but it's one of the four cornerstones of democracy. Oh, and, and furthermore, it's technically legally correct for an amendment to the Constitution. And this does not require, under the new procedures that we have, all of those GD meetings that we had to go through in the past. GD 
be meetings. That's almost. No. Oh, I, I just, I'll let that pass. Th this is an early show. Uh, so. I'll let that pass. But at the <laughs> same time, property rights or no property rights, governments <laughs> must have expropriation powers. You which can take away your property rights. That's right. Well, because we have the, completing, uh, the competing disciplines. One, the public interest in the needs of the taxpayer. There has to be transportation links. There has to be hospitals. We have to have electricity services. And sometimes those requirements encroach upon a private right to property. So the object of this Expropriation Act is to as best harmonize those competing disciplines as possible. Right. Bring I'm, in a fair scale. I move a resolution in our little chamber just now that is demonstrably proven that up to now, the mishmash of expropriation laws, the delays, the bumbling, the mishandling, the attacks from the ombudsman, etc., etc., have proven that our expropriation laws, as of this moment, are a social disaster. They're outmoded. They're arbitrary, they're complicated, and they're contradictory. Right. The Green Paper surely lays down a simple, understandable concept. Yes, it does. All right. We know it's not writ in stone, but briefly, what does the Green Paper suggest if they want to come along and take my house or your house or, or strip a road or whatever? Well, first of all, you have to uh, justify the need for the amount of land required. And uh, if that uh, need is not justified by an approving authority who is not the expropriating authority, we have those two streams there. Uh, you are the expropriating authority, say you're BC Hydro or Highways. Uh, I am a landowner. You choose to have uh, 10 of my acres, and I say, no way, that's, that's far too much. You, you only need three. At that point in time, I can request an inquiry by an inquiry officer, and I make that request to, an ex, uh, to the Expropriation Compensation Board, and they appoint an individual to come in who surveys the matter, who listens to your concerns, can hold a public inquiry, and then we'll get to the approving fellow and say, this is my recommendation. How much time will that take him? No. Ten years? No, no, no. There are very short time frames built into the Act. We can get that underway, I think, in a maximum of, maximum of 30 days and as early as seven. Now, does this expropriation bill for B.C. cover every provincial agency that wants to take something? I'm proposing it be an act of general application. Everywhere? Whether it's the Hydro or That's the B.C. I, Utilities Commission? Or? That is the proposal. So no longer will we have to go to 60 different roadmaps to find 60 different means of uh, fairness or lack of fairness. So after the, the first today. day of the inquiry, the officer has 30 days to say whether he approves the plan. That's right. Then he goes to the approving authority, and the approving authority, this is a, on the supposition that uh, you and I cannot reach an agreement. Right. Now, if we reach an agreement, there's not an expropriation. Right. You've got a willing seller and, and, and a willing buyer. But everybody disagrees nowadays. Uh, most often, the difficulty, uh, to tell you the truth, is in dollars and cents. It's not so much in the land. And, and that is also taken care of, I think, very adroitly in the statute because there is a requirement, if the expropriation is to take place, that you've got to put the money up front, up front money, within seven days, to you. All right, if the expropriation is to take place, is there a time limit on coming to the expropriated price? Like yes. 30 days, 60 days? Yeah, there is. There's a time, I, I, I couldn't give you the specific section, but there is a fairly short time limit coming to the price. But if you differ, if you differ only on price, then it can go to the board to determine price. But by virtue of having this money right off the bat, that should cut down the adversariality. Upfront, early payment, and plus, a very, very important plus. There's a statutory requirement in the bill that's recommended here for the expropriating authority to deliver to you appraisals and all reports which it used as a basis to determine the amount of compensation it's offering to you. In other words, no more slippery deals like we had in the Arrow Lakes and whatnot where the people didn't know whether they were coming or going. Up. Front, up front, early you get payment. All the documents by Hydro or whoever. You get all the That's assessments, right. all That's the appraisals. Sure. And they must, and if the appropriation is approved, they must pay you cash within what time? Oh, they pay you right. They've got to, they have got to deliver that money uh, after approval within seven days. The money has got to be put up front. And then if you differ with the amount of money, you can 
uh, once again go to go to the board, which is which is not it's not going to be a bureaucracy at all. We're contemplating a very very small board, chairman, maybe two other people okay, as now, a maximum. You now have a green paper. That's when right. When will it be law? Well, I'm, uh, first of all, I don't think that we have a monopoly on brains or, or, or on ideas, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that I'm going to force feed this upon the, the public of British Columbia, and that's the specific reason that I've asked for public comment by December the 31st. We hope we'll have all of that gathered by then. To this point in time, I can say there a lot of work has gone into this. When I was the Attorney General, we had uh, some uh, seminars uh, in the province dealing with the topic. We have researched the experience of other jurisdictions, Manitoba, Alberta, Ontario, etc. So to this point in time, a lot of work's gone in, but I still want to hear from the public by December 31. I want to get a complaint. I hope not. I hope we get constructive suggestions. Care about expropriation laws? Call Gardy Garden right now, after the break. You've been around a long time now, Gardy Gardam, not you? Getting a little long in the tooth. Don't you sometimes feel that you'd really like to say what you think about things? Yeah, I do quite often. I mean, because as a cabinet minister, you're under certain constrictions. You must toe the line. Cabinet general. collegiality. Yeah, you must yeah. do that. No, I agree entirely. You've got to do that or you haven't got a government. But you don't have to have collegiality with Trudeau. Can Trudeau do anything now which will really help the economy? What do you think he must do if he really wants to help the economy? Well, first of all, I, I have to say I'm scared stiff about the prospects. Uh, uh, I don't look uh, upon us having a quick recovery at all. Uh, we, we're having a, a crazy stock market today. I'm delighted to see interest rates are dropping, but what will the consistency be over the next months? You just have to open a paper and see the number of plants that are closing, the number of people that are being laid off. Even the CBC, believe it or but not, they don't cut laid, the off French a, language laid off a few people, which yeah. was Mirabella mm. Dictu. But, uh, Who is this Mirabella Dictu? Too marvelous to relate. <laughs> 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 but I tell you, Trudeau's hands, I think they're very much tied. Uh, uh, I think he should scrap the NEP. National energy policy? That's right, and as far as FIRA is concerned, I really said from the beginning that the best fate for FIRA, the Foreign Investment Review Agency, is to put it into a paper bag with a stone and drop it right into the Rideau Canal. But, but what about Canadian but, pride, Canadianization, buying back the oil companies, standing up on our own two feet, facing the you giants? You develop Canadian pride by Canadian effort and Canadian production. You don't develop it when we're short of capital. This. A country is capital hungry, and capital, quite frankly, it's promiscuous. It will go to the best deal, and if we're not offering a good deal for capital, it's not going to come to Canada. Well, my prediction is that the deficit will not be 10 billion, 20 billion, but 30.5 billion. What can he do? That's an incredible deficit. I'd, I'd what be, can he do to cut I'd, that deficit? I'd be prepared to go a, a bottle of whiskey with you that'd be over 30.5, unfortunately. And what can he do is, uh, is self-stimulation within the country. I'd say those two programs uh, should be done away with. I would think another good thing to do would, would be eliminate the, the capital gains tax, once again to, to have capital come here. And, and furthermore, please, in the name of the country, stop confrontative federalism. Our country has prospered best throughout all of our prime ministers by cooperative as opposed to confrontative federalism. Should Trudeau go? I think he asked ask himself that question. You've asked anybody in, in Canada today, they'd say yes. Almost anybody would say That's yes. That's right. Now, it, it's, uh, he, it's, it's a love-hate situation. The, the man was overly agitated. Okay, if he's going to cut the deficit. And perhaps overly criticized to an extent today, but. What can he cut? He won't cut UIC. With his he, can, he cannot touch UIC. That would be folly to touch UIC. Uh, I similarly think it would be folly to touch pensions. I think by the time you got to a means test in pensions and you start to create another level of civil service to take care of that, you, you're not ahead a dollar. And in any event, it comes back in tax what dollars. The baby, the, the baby bonus, that would be very difficult. But I'm afraid what he's going to do. He might go into that area. He might do something with the baby bonus. But uh, what I'm afraid he's going to do, he's going to cut the 
the, the shared cost programs to the provinces and health in the education and in, in human resources right across the country, which, I mean, is, it's, it's, which, is, which is just going to really supplant the national Canadian debt with provincial Canadian listen, debt. Listen, we're going to take calls of appropriation. How do we get off the topic? <laughs> Go ahead, please, to Gardy Gardam. Yes, good morning, Mr. Gardam. Morning, ma'am. Yes, I certainly welcome your proposed changes to the Expropriation Act. Myself, I've uh, known the horrors of the old expropriation laws. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's been uh, the last five years of my life that has been involved with this devastating process. And uh, I'm particularly impressed with, uh, uh, with what you say regarding uh, uh, the expropriating authority uh, being going to be required to prove a need for the land. That's correct. And uh, <clears throat> I think this, is, uh, this uh, should be first and foremost in your green paper, Mr. Gardam that uh, in my particular case, uh, that uh, uh, my, my home is being taken for a parking lot, and... Um, is that uh, you, Lillian? Yes, it is, Mr. Webster. This is Mrs. Mann. Yeah, we yeah. St I started it off on a long, miserable road about four years ago. <laughs> well, well, I think, I think that uh, along with yourself and myself and Mr. Van Der Zand, that we, we have contributed maybe a little bit to this green paper, and uh, we all certainly welcome it, Mr. Gardam that uh, in my particular case, as I say, that um, <clears throat> if there had been a requirement that the uh, expropriating authority should have had to prove a need, um, it would have been stopped right there in its tracks. And um, uh, I see now, uh, at this present time, that, the, uh, that uh, against a great deal of uh, opposition, uh, the expropriation uh, has managed to go through, and they are managing to uh, to destroy my land and uh, put in a parking lot while, be, while right behind the building that they're concerned with, uh, there's lying um, four to five uh, um, acres of land which is just in scrub trees and, and, and never ever has been built upon. Lillian, will you send a little brief to oh, God? I, cer I certainly Good. will. I, I, I have uh, received from uh, Maury Gwynn all the material and I certainly will be presenting uh, uh, my feelings on the whole thing, but I just wanted to uh, to tell Mr. Gardam that uh, thanks very much that uh, it might have come too late for me, but uh, but uh, uh, hopefully it will help somebody else. Thank you, Lillian, and much obliged. One other question of Mr. Gardam, if I may. Yes. <clears throat> this is to do with the present laws. Is there any provision, Mr. Gardam, in the present laws that you're aware of for the expropriation authority to withhold the payment once they ha are using the land? I, I couldn't. I couldn't answer that definitively for you, uh -huh. Mrs. Mann. Uh -huh. It would depend upon what statute the expropriating authority is acting under, uh -huh. and there are about sixty different ones, to the best of my knowledge, in, no. in BC. This, this yeah. would be the municipal yeah. act. I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't give you a specific upon it. In, in, in a large number of the cases, there's not a requirement to have the money up front. There will be under this proposal. Thank you, Lillian. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's gone. What do you know? Maybe it's been expropriated. <laughs> From Port Albany, go ahead, please. Yes, hello? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Mr. Gordon, uh, my, my uh, case is very family, I suppose. I suppose I uh, fight that already for seven years. The city of Port Alberni did it much smarter. They did not expropriate me. They used to my land and my home by uh, flooding it. So, the drainage for my neighbors, they put the drainage pipes around my neighborhood and then they drain it in my land and in my home. Oh dear. So, because of that, I can't sell, I can't rent it, and I suffer. My house is going to rot and wetless. All right, let me and put that in a general way to Mr. Gardner. Well, the, the woman may well have a good case, but she's Mr. not... Mr. Cadom, uh, if I may, please. Yeah. Um, Come on. You know, I was expropriated, but they told me they can't compensate me because that would be a dangerous precedent setting. Oh, I, th I think... I okay, hold on a second, love, please. We'll uh, lose you. Uh, uh, I, this may possibly be the lady's problem. I, I'm not too sure. But under the statute that we have here that we're proposing, 
we will provide compensation for injurious affection. Now, it's a very complicated branch of the law. It goes back, I think, to the law of nuisance, which was developed around the days of Henry II, about your vintage and mine. And as a result of that, it means that uh, if your land is not taken, but the neighboring property suffers consequential, da consequential damage, then that damage can be uh, claimed. Let me give you an example. Supposing I have a gas station, and uh, you're next door with a restaurant, and then the uh, uh, BC Highways decides it's got to move the gas station out in order to have the freeway come in. But it doesn't come close enough to your restaurant. But as a result of what BC Highways has done, you have lost a great deal of traffic to your restaurant. Under those circumstances, providing it was reasonable, you would be able to pr uh, prove a, a claim for damages. Thank you. Well, well one more segment. I want Which, again, sorry, would be before the board. We're trying to keep out of the courts here, but there is an appeal to the Court of Appeal on fact and law. On, yeah. on, on fact and law. Fact and law to the Court of Appeal. Okay, another short segment with Gandhi after the break. I think the Charter of the Rights is a disaster, but then I'm old-fashioned. Yo, well, you are a bit old-fashioned, but it's going to take a while to work through the judicial system. Bleeding right. No question of a doubt about when that. When do our first notwithstandings come in? Oh, I don't think you'll see many of those anywhere in the country. And don't explain that. We'll be here all day. All right. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. I'd Thank like to speak to Adam about the uh, expropriation law from a much smaller uh, point of uh, reference. Instead of uh, looking at the hydro taking over acres of land and uh, big projects of that sort, I'm far more concerned with small properties, uh, specifically in the west end of New Westminster, which are in the, or were in the way of the uh, new highway, Marine Way, and the uh, crossing that will be crossing the Fraser. Good point. The, uh, the houses that have gone at the moment, uh, something like about 30 houses, on the south side of Marine Drive in New Westminster, were actually bought in the open market uh, under ordinary uh, purchase conditions by the highways department. The people applied to the highways department and uh, they were given a price that the value of the house that the highways department wanted. Now in three instances, uh, after the people had accepted the price, and the houses are all gone now by the way, this uh, three people that I know uh, found that they could not move or buy an, uh, a comparable place for themselves unless they moved right out into the country. In other words, the whole problem at this for us smaller people with uh, just a small residential house and a small residential lot is that the value of the property that we own That's and it. we are being uh, vacated from is not the important thing. The important thing is the replacement re price. Now, that's a, that is the key question. Yeah. Are there financial uh, guidelines for what is the proper value of, of residences expropriated yeah, by the I, government? I, I'm, I'm really indebted to this gentleman for his comments because uh, I, I haven't uh, made mention of those yet. There is a definition of fair market value. Fair market value is the bench mark of compensation. But over and above that, if there are any special economic advantages, and I'm referring to Section 33 of the proposed bill now, or if there are any improvements, they would be added to the market value. Over and above that, and the point that the gentleman raised uh, 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 on the telephone was that an owner is entitled to disturbance damages, which would be reasonable costs and expenses uh, uh, of moving, of relocating on, uh, on other land, and any financial losses that are directly attributable uh, to the expropriation. But and the that would be determined, unless the parties agree, between themselves, that would be determined by the expropriation. Appropriation Compensation Board. Now, I don't want, I'm not trying to be tricky, but it doesn't say he, anywhere here that the price I shall be paid for my suburban bungalow will be a price which will be enable me to buy a comparable one nearby. 
there is not a home for home concept in, 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 in the bill at this stage. Now, maybe there's an advantage to have that. Maybe there is a disadvantage to have that. Because you have to remember, in uh, the villain is not always the expropriating authority. No. The villain is not always the person whose land is being expropriated. You have exorbitant demands in some cases on the one hand, and you have absolutely inadequate offers on the other. But you'd say that disturbance damages generally will help to bring the fair market value to something oh, yeah. more equal to oh, the oh, replacement. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And you see, a body of law will be developed by this uh, board, and it will be consistent. It's instead of ha th This has become a cottage industry for some lawyers and accountants and appraisers in, in B.C. today. That and bankruptcy. <laughs> yes, I'd say so. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, this will have a now, a now greater degree of consistency by a board attending to it. And I'd like to make one final point yes, again yes. in response to the gentleman's uh, uh, question. Uh, where uh, I the, the land in involves a residence, then there would be an equivalent to 5% of the market value in that part of the land, including the residence, not exceeding 0.5 hectares. Now, I'm a little old for hectares, but that's about an acre plus, one point. Five percent. Thank you, sir. At least yeah. you've opened the door for a discussion on it. Much obliged. Taking. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Byron. You know, uh, you've had several law commissions proposing to change these laws and you've never done it how do we know that the government is, is sincere this time why don't you show your sincerity this government by doing something about the delta line that was expropriated 13 years ago and never used except for uh, a railway only to the superport oh you're talking about the backup land Dave. Uh, that's right Jack. that's what i'm talking about well, insofar as the sincerity is concerned, sir, we have uh, established this as a green paper. We've requested comments by the uh, end of the year, and uh, once Mr. those are in and my once the last are time they had a law commission distilled, we'll go ahead with it. My yep. lawyer, the last time we had a law commission, asked me to present. I gave five presentals, and he took three of mine to give to you. And it's like a royal commission. Nothing ever came of it. Well, don't give up hope, sir. Don't give up hope. No. 13 years. It'll be Don't give up hope. I'll tell you, sir. Is that Mr. Cuthbert? That's not Mr. Cuthbert. Sounds like another phony to me. This will become the law of B.C., sir. Thank you very much. No, Mr. Cuthbert, there was a settlement made with Mr. Cuthbert uh, recently. And the ombudsman gave you a heck about that, too, did he gave, not? Gave the administration a ombudsman heck about that. Ombudsmen are a nuisance, by and large, aren't well, they? Well, I, uh, I was responsible for the Ombudsman Act. I think omb ombudsmen served a useful purpose. They, they prick governments. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. I'm finding this most interesting and like to see that uh, it's emphasized that they prove need beyond a doubt. And, um, you know, that there's something to be brought in there as well to to protect the, the owners, that the property can resort to the form, former owner, uh, you know, unless it's used within a reasonable time yes. limit. You know, Good point. It's, it's in the bill, ma'am. In the yep. If, if the expropriating authority takes too much of your land, uh, determines it's not required, it can offer it back to you, you are entitled to receive it or you're entitled to the full compensation, whatever you choose. Uh -huh. But uh, this reasonable time limit, uh, you know, they're, they're buying up the land and sometimes, as this last gentleman said, it's 15 years or way to heck down the road and people can't. No, they with their lives when they're they're sitting on some of these properties, uh, such as Mrs. Mann. You know, it's it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Well, I, I I'm the last person in the world who can defend the expropriation laws that we have in the province today. This is why we're developing this initiative. Thank you. What's your room number for this thing? Room one six seven, Parliament Building, sir, Victoria, B.C. Please can write. Can you get a shot of Gandhi shoes there? <laughs> no, no, put them up. Put them up. Deck pause. <laughs> Imagine a cabinet minister wearing Adidas. No, they're deck paws. Deck paws. Yeah, that's right. I've got them on sale. I see. $21 a pair. Not bad. You got another spare pair to sell? Sure. <laughs> I hope you didn't mind me. Just Not at all. Take a shot of your feet. Anything for light relief. Thank you, God. Oh, by the way, the election. What about the election? Oh, I don't even want to ask about it. Eh? I don't want to ask about it. Well, I, uh, I, I, I tell you, I'm a voice in the wilderness. 
as far as elections. I still believe that we should have fixed dates for elections in our country, uh, say every four or five years, uh, but with a double safety valve in that you'd have to have a vote of confidence repeated within 48 or 72 hours to knock a government out. I think that would provide a more effective planning capacities for governments. I think that would also provide an atmosphere which, which would be less adversarial, and I think the taxpayer would get a better bang for his buck, sir. My thanks to Gardy Gardy, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Next, uh, Plimpton, 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 Plimpton. George Plimpton was in town the other day at this big hotel and motel thing down in the Hotel Vancouver. So Steve went down, I couldn't get away, but Steve went down to do a shot for me with this incredible fellow, Plimpton. Here's Stephen Plimpton. Mr. Plimpton, you are probably the world's favorite amateur professional. If you could think back of all the things we know that you've done, what was one that sticks in your mind the most, the most challenging, perhaps? Well, uh, that's very hard to answer. I think each of them has, has, has its moments of... Uh, excitement and pleasure and something to remember. Um, I tend not to wish to rank them. Um, I guess the ones that stick in the mind perhaps are the most recent ones. Hockey with the uh, Boston Bruins is very vivid in my mind. In fact, I have a lot of trouble forgetting, <laughs> forgetting it. Uh, and it was not at all what I expected. It was a uh, very rich and experience and the players all seemed to have wonderful stories to tell and, and much better storytellers and myth keepers uh, than I thought they were going to be. What uh, was more frightening, facing uh, an, uh, an offensive football line or walking a tightrope and for the Willendas? Well, I didn't walk a tightrope with the Willendas. I, I was a trapeze artist. Trapeze artist, sorry. And, uh, uh, well, I don't know how you measure uh, fright. I, I think uh, if on a scale of 1 to 10, they were both 10s. I, I don't know how you get any higher than that. I do think it's interesting that um, what you really are more frightened of than anything else is humiliation. <laughs> it's not being crushed by somebody that weighs 300 pounds or it's not uh, falling into the net. It's, what it is, is is falling into the net when there are a lot of people watching and you're supposed to be completing a, a graceful trapeze act or uh, going back to pass and fumbling the ball. I mean, those are, that's humiliation. And I, in fact, I've never known an athlete who didn't say that was what he was thinking of, um, getting ready to play a game. Right. It's playing, humiliation. Playing to an audience. It's not a, yes, it's failing in the eyes of one's peers uh, or before an audience. That's what's frightening. I suppose the, the one that would come to mind in those circumstances was being a stand-up comic in, in uh, Las Vegas. Yes, you Demanding hope Demanding audience. You hope that, uh, yeah, that comedians talk about this, this sort of moments of flop sweat when uh, they stand there and they throw these lines out there and nothing happens. Uh, the analogy I found was it was a little bit like fishing in the dark uh, and you throw the cast out and you reel that's the joke and you reel it back in and sometimes you you catch the audience and it's very heady it's wonderful but then often you don't and uh, he's reeling in this empty feeling and uh, you throw out another and nothing happens maybe a little sort of sardonic giggle out there and then you're being humiliated and that's the that's as painful on a, sc sc on a scale of 1 to 10, that's a, that's a 10. But you're in a unique situation where if you do fall on your face, you're saved. I mean, it might even be better. <laughs> we might make everybody else in the audience who would like to be doing the same thing you do uh, find yourself in some strange situations where most of us wouldn't find ourselves. If you sort of flop at it, uh, maybe it makes them feel a little good too. I don't know. I've never thought about that. I think what happens is that when you're in a situation like that, you really become a comedian or you become a football player, you can keep telling yourself, well, listen, I'm going to be through with this in 15 minutes and I can go back to my uh, typewriter or go back home and uh, to the kids and so forth, and I'm not going to ever have to do this again. And you keep on telling yourself that, but at the moment of commitment, you are as much a member of that team with just exactly the same feelings of wanting to succeed that they have. And when you don't, it's crushing. Tell me how it started. Um, I think the most memorable, at least the first one that I can remember, is the famous book, Paper Lions. Now, wh what started all that? What was your motivation for getting into this sort of thing? Well, it's an old journalistic trick. It's been done by, uh, or device, it's been done by others. Paul Gallico was the uh, first person I ever heard that did it. It was a fellow called Terhune, who was a writer at the turn of the century, who uh, went and boxed all the great fighters of his time to find out what that was like. 
uh, it's that old adage that if you're going to write about something, get as close to it as you possibly can. So I don't pretend to be the originator of it uh, at all. Uh, the thing that so I did hugely was successful, though. Well, I hope it was the writing more than the act that made it successful. Uh, I, I was lucky. I had uh, wonderful teams to be with. I met some extraordinary characters. Uh, and the thing I, that fascinated me about it was the humor. Uh, you enter these societies, or these closed societies of very physical sports, hockey or football, baseball. You find that uh, there are always half a dozen, maybe more than that, maybe everybody on the team almost, uh, have enormous senses of uh, comedy and of, uh, of jokes and of humor. And these are all sort of hedges against the disciplines of what, what it is that they do, and quite necessary. What was their reaction to, when, to you when you walked into the Detroit Lions locker room that first time? They must have been a bit nervous thinking there was a rookie on the team. Nervous about me? Yeah, being there. No, they weren't nervous about me being there at all. <laughs> I think some of the rookies were probably relieved to think that, that someone uh, as gangly and as uh, unathletic was actually trying out for the team. I mean, there's one guy I'm going to be able to beat out. And I think some people thought I was a specialist, a punter, or some, somebody who did something rather strange. I mean, they, they knew I wasn't much of an athlete, which I'm not. I'm just an ordinary weekend. Uh. It all came down to one play, didn't it? Can you tell me about that, that one crucial play in that game? Well, the, the book paper line is very different than the motion the picture film. paper line. And, and, the, and I think you were thinking about the, the film. film. It right. didn't really come down to any play. The, 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 the device, what it does is to get you through closed doors where no one's ever been before. There wasn't an athlete. And some athletes write about that experience wonderfully well. Uh, Jim Brosnan's books about baseball. Uh, uh, I mean, every, there have been a great many athletes who have been very, very good with writing what, what their world is like. But I think that was the important thing about the sort of thing that I do, is that it does open up these secret doors. Mm -hmm. So you can see it from the inside, but there are no crucial plays or big moments or anything like that. It's really the chance to observe these people. You mentioned earlier that you hope that people remember your stories for the writing rather than the, the performance of the acts, so to speak. Um, and then how do you, what do you consider yourself then as a vocation? Are you a writer first, uh, a performer second? Or? Well, of those two would certainly be a writer. Uh, I think of myself perhaps more as an editor uh, than I am as a writer. I edit a magazine called The Paris Review. Uh, mm -hmm. I've edited a number of uh, books. The last one named E.D., which was a, a very successful uh, book about a rather strange California girl, nothing to do with uh, sports at all. Mm -hmm. And I edited a book about Robert F. Kennedy with a girl named Jean Stein. In fact, we did the book about Edie together. Uh, so uh, my, my function is a literary one, either as an editor or as a writer. But no one would ever say uh, that I was a performer. Uh, I, my uh, statistics as a performer are very feeble. <laughs> Minus 30 yards as a quarterback, and an ERA of, uh, in baseball of, I don't know, 15.8. I mean, can you tell me your, your feelings when you walk into the ring with Moore that time? Uh, walk into the ring with, with, with Archie, the Moore? Archie Moore? Well, there again, this sense of, uh, uh oh, humiliation is almost assured here, <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of wonderment about what he was going to do. The fight uh, was for three rounds. It only lasted for two and a half uh, rounds because um, my trainer, who was a man named George Brown, suddenly saw that Moore wanted to finish this thing off in a very aesthetic way. And obviously, the way you finish something off, uh, aesthetically in boxing, is to knock the other guy out. <laughs> and so he rushed around and got to the timekeeper and rang the bell. It was quite surprising. I can remember the sort of look of surprise coming over Moore. He had 30 seconds more in which to do this job. I once asked Archie Moore how long it would have taken him to finish me off. Mm -hmm. And I had trained for that fight for six months. Six months? Oh. Yeah. He didn't do any good, but... <laughs> and Moore looked at me and he said, about as much time as it would take you to feel the nip of a guillotine. <laughs> and, uh, he's also literary. He's a very literary man, and very funny, and very honorable, and a, a really... Uh, well, of course, in this country, he had that famous fight with uh, Durrell, and... and uh, what was that his name? Uh, uh, I can't remember. It's... Shavala. Shavala. No, not Shavala. No, no, no. Uh, I think it was Durrell. Uh, it was a fisherman from Newfoundland, mm -hmm. and then his Durrells either died or his family got in trouble, and Archie yeah. Moore helped raise funds for him. Mm -hmm. It was really a marvelous act. Of, uh, mm -hmm. And that was one of the greatest fights I ever saw in my life. Moore got knocked down three times in the beginning of it, and, sort of, and he was the light heavyweight champion mm -hmm. at the time. 
Is it difficult for you to jump from, you know, literally the ring into an arena like that of the New York Philharmonic? No. You're, you're a grand percussionist, I remember in that. No, I think everybody can do different things in life. I mean, getting into a car and driving it is entirely different than playing the piano, and there's, there's no, uh, or arguing a law case, uh, what man is capable of shifting his attention and, uh, with great ease. Or a politician, think of the number of things that a politician has to do, or a lawyer during the course of a day. It's just compartmentalizing uh, your attention. So I never found any difficulties. It is odd, I must admit, to be playing percussion in the evening and boxing in the uh, ring in the afternoon. But, I mean, it is one can go through it without going crazy. What's next? Well, I'm going to try to do some of the more of the arts. I think uh, Metropolitan Opera, Looms. A singer. A singer. Well, Luciano Pavarotti, look out. Well, he can help me. <laughs> he can sing in front of me. Is there one ambition that, that in particular, that you may not have a plan for now, but you would like to do sometimes? Or, I mean, you've done so much. Is there anything left, really? Right? Well, I think the ambition of anybody who is a writer is to try to get it down on paper with uh, distinction and uh, humor and, uh, and, uh, and to entertain and to, edu and to educate, which are the two great things I think a writer can do, or move by the power of words. And, and uh, so that would certainly be my ambition, would be able to do that book after book. The trouble with writing is that you never can quite get that close. You always think you're going to, and it's a devilishly hard occupation, and to be very good at it would be, a, would be the dream, I think. You'd be, you, or in other words, uh, I guess I am what I write is almost would be applied to you in a, in a way. Well, yes, except that writing is such a craft that you can make yourself better than you are by being a good writer, mm -hmm. I think. One well, more question, just to clear something up. Is it Atari or in television? There's money writing on this. Oh, it's in television. In television. I never heard of the other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Plimpton. You're very welcome. He's quite a boy, Plimpton. He really is quite a boy. And, you know, he had another chance to have a shave or get his hair done, which is why he looks older than he does. No makeup either. If you saw me without my makeup, you would fall up over your breakfast in the morning. <laughs> but that was a good shot by Steve. Now we're going to try this new feature. That's a fair question. After the break. That's a fair question. This is a new kind of newsy feature we're going to try and start to deal with questions that come from listeners to which we can give short and reasonably succinct answers. And if you send letters to us on that sort of question, we'll probably rewrite the letter for the sake of simplicity so that we can get it in a little clean box on the telly screen. Now, here's our first effort at that's a fair question, and it's from Mr. Publico in Delta. Dear Jack, shocked to learn, it looks shaky, that BC Hydro overpays its employees by 47 million a year. I understand that a big chunk of this money goes to the personnel department, which is apparently overstaffed by 200%. Is this true, Jackie boy? And if so, will Ready Kilowatt Bonner respond to this? Up on me. Here is the report. BC Hydro Personnel Function Review, prepared by R.J. Clifford and Associates on behalf of the BC Utilities Commission for the current hydro rate increase application. I can't really read it, but I understand it, I think. And it says quite brutally, yes, the personnel department of the BC Hydro is overstaffed by 200%. In other words, there are 225 people who work in personnel at the BC Hydro. There should be between 70 and 80. There are three times as many people on the face of it as there are, as there should be. Now, no point in asking Bob Bonner to answer, but the questions will be asked and answered when this report is considered in public by uh, the BC Utilities Commission, which might one of these days earn its keep. I doubt that, mind you, but it might earn its keep. And just to cheer you up about how lucky you are to work in the, the hydro, BC Hydro not only leads in salary levels by a substantial margin, a margin of $47 million over the comparable odds in other companies, $47 million, which gives you $48 a year extra on your light bill to pay for the overstaffing. 
but it also requires fewer hours from engineers and other supervisory, professional, and confidential staff. And they have a wonderful 35-hour week, which they achieve by working 37 and a half hours. And then they get 17 extra Mondays or Fridays off with pay throughout the year. That's plus their very generous holidays. So they work, it's just like the City Hall. It's a four-day week for most of them. You can never get any when you want them. But that's efficiency. But uh, on the face of the Clifford Report, the BC Idol's personnel staffing is a disaster. In fact, it talks about hazy objectives and lack of supervision. And uh, the total overpayments, the IBEW at 20 million bucks, OTEU overpaid by 7.5 million, engineers overpaid by another 7.5 million. The point of this report is that the BC Idol is the best, the kindest, the most generous employer in all of British Columbia. They lead the way. And many other big employers have had to follow them, but not with their generosity, and it's costing thee and me a bundle. But in these days of economic stress, who, who wants to suggest that anybody else is laid off? However, there it is. And yes, the personnel department of BC Idol is overstaffed, got into the Clifford Report by 200%. Next question. Next question. Next question. Next question. Dear Jack, why are retired police and others who get indexed pensions allowed to hold full-time positions with the civil service? And is it correct that in the motor carrier branch in Burnaby, eight out of 12 inspectors are ex-police on all on indexed pensions? Yes. Of the six inspectors at the Motor Carrier Commission in Burnaby, five are ex-RCMP officers who also collect pensions. All of them had to compete for the jobs according to the standard policies of the BC Public Service Commission and were found to be the most suitable candidates. There is nothing to prevent anybody with a government pension getting another government job after they have retired and collect their full pensions, a full salary, and sometimes contribute to a, a second or an increased pension as well. This is a naughty K-N-O-T-T-Y problem. Because people out of work these days are bound to hold resentment against the hiring of pensioners, sometimes in their advanced years, because of their specific skills. Almost anybody can do any job in the government with some training. Is that snide? No, I don't think so. So if you've got a pension, apply for a job at the BC government in the normal times, you'd get in quickly because of your expertise. But I don't think it's fair. Admirals and wing commanders and uh, t directing traffic at the ferries and all these Navy boys, you know, they're on the BC ferries. Ah, well, they got golden handshakes and now they've got golden jobs. <laughs> Next question. Dear Jackie boy. I feel that widows under 65 in Canada are getting a rotten deal. When my husband died after 43 years of married life, all of a sudden my fixed income was cut to less than half. And now I'm going to pay full property taxes on my house. Is there anything that can be done about this? Yes, there is something that can be done about it. Any person over 65, any widow or widower, and handicapped person to qualify under gain guidelines, are not required to pay property taxes until the title of the house is transferred, sold on death or whatever. This is the measure brought in by the NDP in 1974, the Land Tax Deferment Act. And of course, if you live in there till you die, after your husband's gone or your wife is gone, the house is sold and the back taxes must be paid. Uh, but they only charge you at the moment 8% a year on your deferred taxes. The provincial government gives a grant to the municipality in lieu of your deferred taxes. It's a funny thing. We checked this out yesterday. And of all the hundreds of thousands of property owners, many of whom qualify, only 2,000 property owners applied for the deferment in the last complete years. But if you're over 65, if you're a widow, a widower, a handicapped person under the game guidelines, you can defer your taxes until the house is eventually sold. Next question. Dear Jack, last month I was involved in a traffic accident which was not my fault. The police charged the other driver. When I reported the accident next day to the ICBC Claim Centre in Surrey, 
I was told I would have to pay towing charges and storage at the wreck cares until the claim was settled. Is that fair? Should I have to pay this when I wasn't at fault? Claims adjusters do have the authority, we're told by Icky Bicky, to use their discretion in paying out towing and storage charges before the final claim settlement, if in their opinion it's straightforward and the other guy's going to pay. But they don't have to pay them. And the ICBC policy states that towing and storage charges will be paid once it is de determined who is at fault. So you might have to pay for the towing of your car away after an accident. I didn't know that. I thought they just came along, whipped it up, and took it away for repair, and that was part of the cost, but apparently not. In the meantime, keep your receipts handy in case you win. Last question. <laughs> what happens to a hooker or a drag queen who is fined under Vancouver's anti-prostitution bylaw and then p fails to pay the $350? Does he or she or it go to jail? Now what about the client? Can he go to jail if he's fined? And this is very appropriately signed John, which is a synonym for a hooker's customer. Let me tell you this funny story on prostitution. You know, we had a perfectly good and useful criminal code which allowed people who solicited for the sale of sex to go into the criminal courts and be fined. And it was a very good health preventive measure. If they didn't pay the fine, they went to jail. Sometimes went to jail after three or four offenses. And then they were treated for potential disease. And when they came back out again, they were in better shape than they to go back on the streets, you might say. And then we had all this kerfuffle with Supreme Court decisions which never made any sense to me. And Vancouver, in its desperation, passed this bylaw, which makes it a bylaw offense to solicit sex for sale on the streets. You, feel, you hear all these people hammering that there's nothing illegal about prostitution. And on the face of it, there isn't. But selling it is illegal. Now here's the funny bit. $350 fine. The Johns, the customers, and the number, scores of them have been booked and charged. They pay their fines and run. $350. Hookers sometimes pay their fines. Oftentimes they don't pay their fines. Now, is there any penalty for not paying their fine? No. There is no default. It's not $350 or seven days in jail. It's $350. And if the Crown wants to collect that fine from a hooker who doesn't choose to pay it, the Crown has got to take the hooker and a second set of appearances to small debt courts and attach her assets. No. I mean, that's just, just stupid. Born stupid. There aren't enough lawyers in town to go to small debt courts on successive actions for hookers and johns who don't pay their fines. So the bylaw is a mockery, an absolute mockery. Willing prostitute, after a good day, will pay her fine. After a bad day, if she doesn't pay her fine, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to chase her for it. Merely gives her another mark in her convictions. Mind you, there's another story there about people who don't pay fines. But that's the one I wanted to ask her. Yes. There is no additional penalty for a hooker who doesn't pay a fine unless the Crown wants to assign a lawyer to go to small debt court, track down her assets, if any, and seize them and sell them to collect the fine. I don't know. I sometimes wonder what kind of bleeding society we live in. Free for all after the break. Keep your calls short, please. Go ahead, please. Right. I uh, talking about the penalty points for ICBC. Yeah. And uh, when you are on my 16th birthday, I got my driver's license. I racked up a whole mess of points. I had over 12 points in my yeah. first year of driving. Now, if I lose three points and gain three points a year, right? Let's say I get another ticket. Um, the uh, I lose the three points, and I get billed every year okay, on my birthday, 400 and some odd dollars for having... Uh, yeah, sure you should. Now, hold on a second. We've only got a short segment here. Uh, I'm going to go up the line and see what people want to talk about in case I can find something of general interest. What do you want to talk about? Ferry rates. Ferry rates, hold on. What do you want to talk about? Mr. Mr. 
Trudeau's... Trudeau's broadcast. Hold on, please. What do you want to talk about? Hospitals. Hold on, please. What do you want to talk about? Hello there. Hello? What do you want to talk about? Yeah, I want to talk about uh, that, what you said about the hookers. The, the government has to take them to court. Hold on, don't go away. Hookers on five. What do you want to talk about? Yes, Mr. Gordon's statement, basically, about the uh, uh, investor uh, confidence okay. in the country. Hold on, please. What do you want to talk about? Is, is that me, Jack? I you. Uh, well, I, all I want to compliment you on this question that you uh, displayed on television and answered the same question at the same time, because it's more explanatory than any question instead of cutting the people off. Here, 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 sir. Much better. I'm not going to cut you off. I'm going to go to Trudeau first. Go ahead, please, sir. Good morning. I was just uh, feeling that uh, there is a great opportunity here to return Mr. Trudeau's gesture to the Canadian people in kind. Uh, and I would like to exhort the people of British Columbia and Canada to switch off Trudeau tonight, tomorrow, and the day after. Don't listen to him. Uh, God, he got, uh, a certain friend of mine made, made a very good crack about it today. I said, what do you think of these three miniseries? And he said, maybe on the third broadcast he will rise again. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's wicked. Well, I just want everybody to switch off Pierre. Oh, thank you very much. Switch thank off you. Pierre. God, you sound like one of these people, one of these Canadians that climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> I would like to. That's a good joke. But only I appreciated it. Oh no, just a minute. Made a mistake. Go ahead. Goodness gracious, what's happening here? I'm being deserted in droves. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, you were saying that uh, the government has to take a hooker to court to recover the fine. That's right. I was wondering, does that apply to everything, like, say, an impaired driving charge? Would they have to take that to small dad's court to recover that, too? No, that's criminal code. You go straight to jail if you don't pay the fine. Oh. But you get lots of time to pay. But you yeah. go straight to jail. Now, under a provincial summary conviction offence, you don't have to go to jail because the NDP wiped out jail for provincial summary offences. They've got to take you, I think, the county court for provincial summary offences, fines. But for half the offences in this country, they just fine you and forget it. Oh, yeah. It's a comic opera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all you can call it, a comic opera. Very fairs. Very fairs. The uh, current government says they want a 6% restraint, and yet they raised the ferry fare for passengers 7%. Uh, 25 cents is not 6% of $3.50. It's actually... Uh, Almost 7%. I'll take your word for it. You could probably take them to court on it, but why bother? I want to know if they wiped out these inter-island free freebies in the Gulf. That's what I want to know. Well, Jack, if, if they were to sell more tickets and have more people traveling on the ferries, maybe they would make more money rather than selling less at a higher price. You're probably right. After the break. I don't really look like Charles Lawton. That's a slander. Uh, Victoria, go ahead, please. Hello? Yeah, Victoria. Hello? Jack? Yes, ma'am. OK. Re this matter of hookers. Yes, ma'am. It's a problem that has bugged me for years. Yes, ma'am. I run a business. Mm -hmm. I write a sales slip. I pay sales taxes to the government. Now, why in God's little green acres can't these girls or boys, whichever, who are earning a living by their choice that way, do the same thing? Pay and taxes. Pay taxes and, and, okay, their profession be accepted as what it is, because as long as there are men wealthy enough to pay them, they're going to exist. I got, news the money, the I got news for you. The I got news for you. I got news for you. Hookers pay taxes when the tax department can get them. Any income, whether it's from gambling, hooking, or whatever, is taxable. There was a celebrated case a number of years ago here, where uh, the tax department had warned this hooker to keep her books. Yeah. And she kept very detailed books. Good. I covered the trial myself and saw the nine books of exhibits and. Uh -huh. It not only gave whether the customers were to pay by cash or billed monthly or whether checks were acceptable, uh -huh. but she complained to the income tax department, this is many years ago, yeah. that she wanted to deduct graft she allegedly paid to civic officials. Uh -oh. 
and she lost the case in the Exchequer Court because she wouldn't name the civic officials to whom she allegedly had paid this money. Uh. A good organized prostitution uh, operation, and we've had a number in Vancouver, pays its taxis. Uh -huh. The trouble is that when they keep the books to pay the taxis and the morality squad swoops, <laughs> they get the books and all the details. So if, a, if you're running a good house of ill repute, you must keep books for the income tax, and that woman, I'm sure, paid almost every nickel of taxes that she had to pay. What could we do about the, the, the rampant, uh, uncontrolled stuff? I don't know. You don't have hookers in Victoria, do you? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> no, of course. Don't be ridiculous, ma'am. You'll shatter you know, my childish... Jack, Many, many people have said they wished you would come to Victoria at least once a month. Most of the people I've talked to have said once a week. City of the nearly dead and the newly wed. Don't kid yourself, my dear. No, no. This is where the action is, not Vancouver. <laughs> Vancouver's bigger. But as the Americans say, bigger isn't necessarily better. Did you say you ran a store? Yes, <laughs> and I'm right in the heart of the city with government offices all around me, including the parliament buildings themselves. Depressing, isn't it? No, it's rather fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll tell Fotheringham to drop in and see you from time to time. Well, I think I think you should be over here oftener, my dear. Ah, and a lot of us do. It's such, I hear it in the store. It's such a drag. No, it isn't. Flying over there. And well, flying yeah, back I again. Well, you know, you've got to travel, but then... Taking cruise. Oh, well, that's honey. fun. Listen, I've got to take this guy in one, because <laughs> I promised to take him. The points business. Okay. Um, you, you get your penalty point, uh, points paid to, uh, billed to you uh, once a year. On Why do you day. keep getting tickets? Okay. I, I get You're one stupid. ticket a year. Okay, you know, so that doesn't let my points go down at all. That's your fault. Okay, so it is. But if, am I going to be paying my uh, penalty points for the rest of my life? At yes. $50 a year? Yes. Is that fair? Yes. It is? Either stop driving or drive like me, sanely, decently, and with consideration at all times. Yeah. Now, I know it's somebody for <laughs> None what's. Why should you have somebody? See the way some people drive. Mind you, I'm getting old and a wee bit nervous, but it just scares me half to death. What else was I going to say? That's a fair question. Sharp, sharp, clearly written letters, and we'll try and get from our massive research staff, we'll get the answers after the break. Going to have a close look at the problems of the Law Society and their negligence insurance problems. They're apparently in some form of deep trouble. I'm going to have Frank Masco and Bobby Guile here tomorrow to cross-examine them on the protection for the public at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> More on the Bandiero case on Czech TV at midnight. A close look at the Law Society. Tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> 